The ancient market town of Alton in Hampshire is situated approximately 55 miles to the southwest of London. It grew up around a ford over the northern branch of the River Way and was once an important staging point on the road from London to Winchester. The Swan, which still stands on the High Street, was once a noted coaching inn and we will return to this historic building later on in the story. In the early 19th century, the town became a centre for hop growing and by the mid-1800s, two breweries had been established here, drawn by the abundance of hops and the superior quality of the water of the River Way. Each year at the end of August, the town's population would be swollen by a large influx of itinerant workers who would arrive from the poorer parts of Portsmouth, Southampton and London to pick the hops. They would live in small huts and sheds that had either been hastily erected just prior to their arrival or else had been used to accommodate cattle and pigs during the cold winter months. Although the work was hard and the hours long, this was the closest these people came to an annual holiday, providing as it did the opportunity to enjoy the fresh country air whilst also enabling them to earn a little money. A short distance from the town centre, lay, and still lies, flood meadows, a picturesque open space through which the river way meanders and above which in the 1860s was Amory Farm and the Hop Garden. Although over the years some notable people have had connections with Alton, perhaps the most notable being the author Jane Austen, it is safe to say that not a great deal had ever happened in Alton to bring it to national notice. In fact, apart from the 1643 Battle of Alton, when, during the Civil War, parliamentarian troops succeeded in capturing the royalist-held town, life for the everyday residents of Alton was peaceful and unexciting, and few people outside its boundaries ever really gave it a first, let alone a second, thought. That was to change on Saturday the 24th of August, 1867, when a shocking and horrific murder occurred just beyond Flood Meadows that catapulted this unassuming Hampshire market town into the national spotlight. The victim was eight-year-old Fanny Adams, and her name is still remembered in the phrase Sweet Fanny Adams, meaning nothing, as in, I got nothing out of this, which, according to some sources, was later shortened to Sweet F.A. and used as a substitute for a far more obscene expletive of the same initials. She lived here on Tanhouse Lane with her parents, George and Harriet Adams, and her five siblings. According to Lloyd's newspaper, Fanny was a tall, comely, and intelligent girl who bore the appearance of being several years in advance of her age. Her father was a bricklayer, employed by the local builders J. H. and E. Dyer, and her mother supplemented his meagre earnings by taking in the neighbour's laundry. Saturday the 24th of August was a hot and sunny day. Just before noon, Fanny's father, George, headed off to play cricket for the church bellringers team in their annual match against the village band team, which was to be held at the Butts, a pleasant area of grassland located to the southwest of the town centre. Once her husband had left, her mother busied herself with her chores, whilst Fanny, her younger sister Lizzie, and Fanny's best friend, neighbour's daughter, seven-year-old Minnie Warner, played happily together. At around one in the afternoon, the girls announced that they were going to play in the meadows, and off they went, affording Harriet a little peace and quiet as she went about her chores. Fanny, so the newspaper's ledger reported, was wearing a white pinafore, red wool underskirts, and a brown velvet hat. The children made their way along Tanhouse Lane and passed through the gate at its end onto Flood Meadows. On the far side of the meadows was a sunken section of an old road, which was known as the Hollow, and which ran alongside the hop garden of Amory Farm. The girls often used to play here, but on this Saturday they made their way to the banks of the river, where they began picking flowers. As they did so, they were approached by a young man, who was dressed in a black frock coat, light waistcoat and trousers, and who was wearing a tall hat. According to Minnie Warner's inquest testimony, he greeted them with, Halloa! whereas in her trial evidence, given in December 1867, she said that his greeting was, Ah, my little tulips, 
what are you playing at? Minnie immediately recognised him as a man whom she and two other friends had met in Flood Meadows the previous Saturday, on which occasion he had chatted with them and watched them play together, so she wasn't in the least bit wary as he approached this time. Having put the girls at their ease, the man gave Minnie two half pennies and said that he would give her a third if she and Fanny would race each other to the hollow. He also gave Fanny and Lizzie a half penny each. The girls duly raced off as the man had requested, and having followed them, he joined them in picking berries. A few minutes before two, Mrs. Eliza White was making her way along the footpath above the hollow, when looking down she saw a man with three children by its approach. The children were picking berries and flowers, whilst the man, according to Mrs. White's later testimony, was loitering about with his hands in his pockets. He was smoking something dark, but Mrs. White couldn't see whether it was a pipe or a cigar. Eliza was waiting for her own daughter, so she remained watching them for around fifteen minutes, at which point the children turned and ran into the hollow, and the man went after them, after which Eliza saw nothing more of them. Having entered the hollow, the man picked some more berries for the girls, and then, turning to Lizzie and Minnie, he told them that they should go home and spend their half-pence. He asked Fanny to go with him, promising her another two pence if she would do so. Taking her by the hand, he began leading her away from her two companions. But then Fanny became reluctant to go any further with him, at which point, according to Minnie Warner, he lifted her up in his arms and carried her up the hollow and into the hop-ground. Minnie heard Fanny cry out that her mother would be calling her and that she wanted to go home, but the man ignored her and continued walking. Neither Minnie nor Lizzie appears to have sensed that Fanny was in any danger, and they hurried off to spend the money the man had given them on sweets. A little after the two girls had set off, Eliza White climbed over the stile and made her way across the meadow. When she was about halfway across, she heard a child cry out from the direction of the farthest side of the hop garden. She later stated that it did not seem to be a cry of pain, it was a sound such as a child would raise when caught hold of in play. Eliza didn't know it at the time, but there is every likelihood that she had heard the early stages of the murder of Fanny Adams. The man who had abducted Fanny was 29-year-old Frederick Baker, who worked as a clerk for Clement's solicitors at 42 High Street, directly opposite the Swan. He came from Guildford, a market town about 20 miles from Alton, where his father, Frederick Baker Sr., was a master tailor. Baker had moved to Alton 12 months ago and was a lodger at Sarah Kingston's boarding house at number 69 High Street. That Saturday morning he had started work at ten o'clock. According to a fellow clerk, when Baker came into work he seemed as though he had been drinking, and Baker confessed that he had consumed gin and beer at the Swan before coming into the office. At eleven o'clock he had gone back over to the Swan for another drink, and he began flirting with the barmaid. He made a clumsy attempt to kiss her, whereupon the landlady expressed surprise that he should begin his day in such an unseemly manner. "'Oh, never mind,' was Baker's reply. "'You will not see me again.' After fifteen minutes, Baker left the pub and returned to the office. According to his fellow clerks, he went back to the Swan about an hour later, returning to the office around a quarter to one. Morris Biddle, a workmate, would later testify that Baker had certainly been in the office when he went to lunch at one o'clock. Baker left the office again shortly after Biddle's departure, and he had walked to Flood Meadows, where he encountered the three girls. William James Walker, a whitesmith and bellhanger, had passed him at around one thirty as Baker was striding across Walnut Tree Meadow, which adjoined Flood Meadows, and Walker was struck by how vacant and glazed he looked, as though he were partly intoxicated. William Allwork, cricket bat maker of Alton High Street, had been crossing Flood Meadows at around a quarter to two when he saw Baker leaning against a gate. Further down the hill he could see three children playing, and he heard one of them shout, I'll tell your mother, Minnie. <laughs> 
at around ten to three, and Murrant met Baker as he was walking from the hop garden towards St. Lawrence's Church. Anne had been particularly struck by his civility as he had held the church gate open for her. Nothing about his appearance, she later testified, struck her as in any way peculiar. At two minutes past three, under-shepherd George Noyce, who was most specific about the time, because he owned a watch, saw Baker walking towards the hop garden. On sighting Noyce, Baker had attempted to hide his hands under his coat skirts. Noyce watched Baker cross the bridge leading to the old Basingstoke Road, and he had seen him pause briefly to throw something into the river. Just before the road stood Flood Meadow Cottage, where Mary Ann Porter was sitting outside her door when she saw Baker go past her garden and turn left along the road, heading towards Alton. She saw him again at around six, and this time he stooped down several times to do something to his trousers or feet. As he passed her this second time, he looked her full in the face, as though looking to see if she was watching him. One of the most significant witnesses to have seen Baker that afternoon was seven-year-old Alfred Vince, who later stated that at about five o'clock that afternoon he was standing by the gate in Tanhouse Lane when he saw a man come out of the hollow and cross Flood Meadows to the place where the boys bathed. The man's coat sleeves were turned back and his hands were red. Vince watched the man wash his hands and then wipe them dry with a pocket handkerchief. Noticing Vince, the man had run towards him, at which point the boy had run away. It should be said that doubt has been cast on Alfred Vince's veracity as a witness, since he didn't come forward until after the inquest into Fanny's death and Baker's first court appearance. Indeed, at Baker's trial in December, Vince admitted that he had been taken to Winchester jail for an identity parade by his mother, where a man in a tall hat had been standing several feet away from the other men. As he and his mother passed the man in the tall hat, his mother had nudged him, whereupon he had stopped and said, That's the man! At some time between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, Harriet Adams realised that Fanny hadn't returned home with the other children. She therefore made inquiries of several neighbours to ascertain if any of them had seen her. They hadn't. At around 5.30, Jane Gardner, who lived three doors away, called round to see if there was any news of Fanny's whereabouts. As they talked, Minnie Warner went past, returning from a trip to the sweet shop, and Jane Gardner asked her when she had last seen Fanny. The blood must have drained from the women's faces, as Minnie told them about the events of a few hours before, and about Fanny being carried away by the man in the tall hat. With a dreadful sense of foreboding, Harriet and Jane headed off along Tanhouse Lane and hurried across Flood Meadows, with Minnie following close behind, desperately trying to keep up with them. As they drew close to the hollow, a young man in a tall hat came strolling down the slope, heading towards the Basingstoke Road. At this point Minnie Warner caught up with them and told them that this was the man who had carried Fanny away. Jane Gardner called for him to stop, but the man kept on walking. However, following a second shout from Mrs. Gardner, the man came over. "'What have you done with the child you took away?' demanded Jane. The man replied that he had not seen a child. "'Did you give some children some half-pence?' Jane asked. The man made no answer, so Jane turned to Minnie and asked her, "'Did this gentleman give you any money today?' "'Yes,' replied the girl. Three pence. No, said the man, it was three half pennies. Turning to Mrs. Adams, Jane asked, Why don't you give him in charge? I am quite willing to go with you to the police, said the man, and so saying, he began walking away. We shall have your name, Jane shouted after him. I am to be found at Mr. Clement's office, the man shouted back as he continued on his way towards the bridge that led to the Basingstoke Road, where he would be seen by Mrs. Porter, and possibly by Alfred Vince. Jane and Harriet returned to Tanhouse Lane, still believing, according to the London Evening Standard, that Fanny was probably playing about some of the neighbouring fields, and would return before long. Baker, meanwhile, had returned to his office, 
Maurice Biddle arrived back from his tea break at around 6.15 and later stated that Baker came in about five minutes later. At seven o'clock, the two clerks went over to the Swan for a glass of ale. As they crossed the high street, Baker told Biddle about the women speaking to him about the missing girl and said that it would be very awkward for him if the child was murdered or anything as he supposed he should be blamed for it. Once in the pub, they got into conversation with the Boots, who told them that he was going away on Monday. Baker said that he would go with him, to which the Boots replied that he could turn his hand to anything, but Baker could not. Baker's response had been, Yes, I could turn butcher. As the two clerks chatted in the pub, Mrs Adams arrived at the office, where she spoke to the chief clerk, William Trimming, about her missing daughter, and about the man she and Jane Gardner had met in Flood Meadows, who said he worked for the firm. Trimming told her that the man's name was Frederick Baker. Mrs Adams had then returned to Tanhouse Lane, where, according to the Evening Standard, the neighbours were discussing Fanny's disappearance and, fearing some foul play in the matter, formed a search party and headed off to Flood Meadows to look for the missing girl. At around twenty to eight, Thomas Gates, who looked after the hop garden, heard about the missing child and, on learning that she had last been seen in the vicinity of the hop garden, he went there to look for her. The first thing he found that suggested anything was amiss was a child's dress that was covered in blood. Walking on a little further, he later recounted, I came across the head of a child lying on two hop poles on the ground. The head was dirty and the eyes had been gouged out. Other parts of the body were scattered across the hop garden. It was more than apparent to Gates that the body of the poor victim had been dissected by her murderer and the sight of the body parts strewn all around the hop garden affected him so deeply that he slumped to the ground, utterly distraught. In this state he was found by Police Constable Thomas Light and engine driver Charles White, who both arrived at the scene shortly afterwards as part of the search party. Constable Light immediately took control and instructed White to pick up the body pieces, wrap them in a cloth and an apron, and take them to the Leathern Bottle Inn on Amory Street, a building that still stands today, albeit it is no longer a pub. Here, over the next few hours, searchers brought other parts of the body as they were found. Members of the search party had headed to Tanhouse Lane to tell Mrs Adams of what had been found. On hearing the news, she became frantic and rushed off to tell her husband, but had gone hardly any distance before she collapsed in grief and had to be carried home by the neighbours, several of whom then went to the butts to break the terrible news to George Adams. On hearing it, he raced home, where, on being told that Frederick Baker was suspected of being the perpetrator of the atrocity, he seized a loaded shotgun and hastened to the hop gardens, intending to shoot him. Not finding him there, he returned home, where the neighbours persuaded him to hand them the shotgun, and two of them then sat up with him throughout the long night. Meanwhile, Biddle and Baker had left the swan, Biddle returning to the office, and Baker going to a nearby chemist to buy some scent. Hearing about the gruesome find in the hop garden, Biddle went to the chemist, where he confronted Baker with the news. "'They say you have murdered a child!' Biddle exclaimed. Never, Morry, replied Baker. It is a bad job for me, then. Well, let's go to the office and see if there's any truth in it, Biddle suggested, and the two headed back to Clements. No sooner had they arrived than William Dogrell, whose father owned a baker shop in Market Square, came racing in. Where's Baker? he panted. They say he's been and murdered a child. Baker stepped forward and said that he was innocent. By this time, a small crowd was gathering outside the office. At around 9pm, Superintendent Cheney arrived at Clements, where he found Baker leaning against a desk, smoking a cigar and still wearing his tall hat. He asked Baker if he had heard of the murder. Yes, came the reply, and they say it's me, don't they? Yes, you are suspected, said Cheney. I am innocent, and I am willing to go where you like, was Baker's reply. 
What knives have you about you? demanded Cheney. Baker produced two knives, one with two blades and the other three-bladed. Cheney observed that the larger blade of the two-bladed knife had a slight smear of blood near the edge. The superintendent then left to see Minnie Warner and Jane Gardner, and from what they told him, he returned to Clements and arrested Baker on suspicion of having murdered Fanny Adams. Baker repeated that he was innocent. He was taken to the police station, located on Butts Road, and here he was told to undress. When he had done so, Cheney examined his clothing and found that the left leg of his trousers, his left stocking and left boot were soaking wet, whilst his right trouser leg was damp. Asked to account for this, Baker replied that it proved nothing, as he was in the habit of stepping into the water when he went out for a walk. It looked to Cheney as though the trousers had been recently washed, and on closer inspection he detected what appeared to be spots of blood on them. On examining Baker's shirt, it appeared that the left wristband had also been recently washed, and on looking closer, Cheney found spots of blood on it as well. He asked Baker if he could account for the bloodstains, but his prisoner could offer no explanation. Baker was then placed in a cell. Over in the hop garden, more body parts had been found, and they were also taken to the leathern bottle. As darkness had now fallen, the search was wound down for the night. Constable Light had the remains thus far found placed in a sheet, and they were taken to the police station, where they were locked in a cart shed. In Tanhouse Lane, neighbours kept George and Harriet company throughout that long night, as they struggled to come to terms with the horror that had befallen their family. The search was resumed on the Sunday morning, and more body parts and items of clothing were recovered and conveyed to the police station. Fanny's brown velvet hat was retrieved from the middle of a hedge. William Henry Walker found a slab of stone close to the post where the head had been discovered the previous evening. It was covered in blood, and there were some long hairs and three or four pieces of flesh on it. The search was hampered by the arrival of hundreds of sightseers who, on learning of the murder, had travelled to Alton by train, and having walked the short distance from the station to the hop garden, were intent on taking away souvenirs from the scene. That afternoon, local physician Dr. Louis Leslie began the grim business of carrying out a post-mortem. Fanny's body, it transpired, had been cut into at least twenty pieces, and parts were still missing, but Dr. Leslie did what he could to reassemble the remains. He concluded that the cause of death had been a blow to the skull from a heavy object, probably the stone that had been found earlier that day by William Walker. Dismemberment, he deduced, had been carried out after death, and the poor child would have died instantly and suffered no torture. Once the doctor had completed his examination, George Adams was brought to the police station, and here he suffered the harrowing experience of having to identify the body of the deceased as that of his daughter, Fanny Adams. Early on the morning of Monday the 26th of August, Baker was taken before the local magistrate, Edward Knight, and was remanded in custody until the Thursday of that week. According to newspaper reports, later that day, a great crowd of persons, especially of women, turned up outside the police station and yelled and hooted the prisoner most vociferously. That afternoon, Superintendent Cheney returned to Clement's office with a set of keys he had taken from Frederick Baker on the Saturday night, and unlocking the drawer of Baker's desk, he found a diary in which, under Saturday the 24th of August, was written the chilling entry killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. Cheney took the diary to the police station, where he showed it to Baker, who confirmed that it was his handwriting, and said that he had written it after he had seen the two women, but he had not meant to enter it like that, and had only done so because he was intoxicated when he wrote it. The inquest into the death of Fanny Adams was held at the Duke's Head on Butts Road on the afternoon of Tuesday the 27th of August with the Deputy Coroner for Hampshire, Mr Robert Harfield, presiding. The Duke's Head still stands, although it is now known as the George. 
Frederick Baker was brought in handcuffs from the police station, and, amidst hoots and yells from the crowd assembled outside, he was taken into the Duke's head, where he was placed on a sofa behind the deputy coroner. Reporting on the prisoner's appearance, the Hampshire Telegraph informed its readers that he was somewhat slightly built, and if his features are not prepossessing, they are by no means repulsive. He was, the paper continued, naturally pale, and his eyes being singularly sparkling, the anxiety which he manifests has rendered his appearance very careworn, and on Tuesday afternoon he was at times extremely nervous. Outside the Duke's head the crowd grew more and more agitated, and as many as could pressed their faces to the windows, trying to see the accused. Harfield began by warning the jury that from what he had heard and from what they had read in the papers, they would have to listen to a very melancholy tale. But he thought it better not to say anything more before the inquiry was gone into. The twelve members of the jury were then taken to the police station to view the body, and on their return the inquest got under way. The first witness was Minnie Warner, who recounted the events of the previous Saturday. When asked by the deputy coroner if the man who had carried Fanny away was present, she looked around the room, but was so unnerved by the crowd staring in at the windows and talking loudly that she was unable to identify Baker as the man. The next witness was George Adams, who identified the victim as his daughter. The poor man, so the Morning Herald reported, seemed nearly heartbroken, and gave his brief evidence in much grief. His wife Harriet then testified as to the events of the Saturday and of her meeting with Baker on the evening of her daughter's murder. The inquest continued throughout the afternoon as various witnesses appeared to give details of the events leading up to the finding of Fanny's body and of what had happened in the interim between then and the inquest. Following Jane Gardner's evidence, the deputy coroner turned to Baker and told him that he thought it only fair to allow him to ask any questions of the witness. "'I have no questions to ask at present, thank you,' was Baker's reply. Once all the witnesses had been heard, the deputy coroner asked Baker if he would like to say anything. "'No, sir, only that I am innocent.' Harfield then summed up the evidence, and, after a brief deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against Frederick Baker for the killing of Fanny Adams. The crowd outside had now increased dramatically, swollen by a large number of farm workers who had finished their day's labours in the fields around Alton. On news of the verdict, the mood became even more hostile, with cries of, "'Lynch the villain!' echoing from the street outside. The police deemed it best to detain the prisoner at the Duke's head until the clamour and excitement had died down. After two hours, all but trapped inside the pub, they snuck Baker out of the back door, walked him across the yard at the side of the pub, and hustled him out of the gate. Surrounded by a body of police officers, Baker was hurried towards the police station. But then a small knot of spectators spotted them, and a cry went up that the prisoner was in the street, whereupon the angry mob surged towards them, hissing and shouting, and a barrage of sticks, stones, and other missiles were flung at the party, as the police made a smart dash with their prisoner to the safety of the police station, where, no doubt much to his relief, Frederick Baker was once more locked inside his cell. The next day, Fanny Adams was laid to rest in Alton Cemetery. A large number of persons assembled to witness the funeral. Wreaths of flowers were placed upon the coffin and subsequently upon the grave. A memorial stone, paid for by public subscription, would later be erected over her grave. It was made by her father's employers, J. H. and E. Dyer. Shortly after eleven o'clock on the morning of Thursday the 29th of August, Baker was taken by cab from the police station to the town hall, where an angry mob awaited his arrival. They yelled, booed, and hissed at him as he was ushered inside the building to appear before the local magistrates. The charges having been read out, George and Harriet Adams repeated the evidence they had given at the inquest two days before. According to the Hampshire Telegraph, 
The poor husband became dreadfully agitated while his wife was giving evidence, and looking towards the prisoner, frantically exclaimed, "'You are a villain!' The prisoner was apparently unmoved by the exclamation. Once all the witnesses had been heard, the magistrate asked Baker if he wished to make any statement in answer to the charge. "'I am not careful to answer the charge at present,' replied the prisoner. "'I am as innocent as the day I was born.' The magistrate ordered him to stand trial for the murder of Fanny Adams at the next Hampshire Assizes. Then came the difficult task of getting him from the town hall and back to the police station. The Hampshire Telegraph reported on the mood of the crowd outside the town hall. The removal of the prisoner from the town hall to the police station, preparatory to his removal to Winchester Jail, was not effected without some considerable difficulty. The moment the crowd outside caught sight of the prisoner, they uttered frightful yells and execrations, and an attempt was made to upset the cab in which he was taken away, which in all probability would have proved successful had it not been for the very vigorous manner in which the driver of the vehicle plied the whip. It was decided that taking him to Winchester Jail by train would be too problematic, so he was taken the eighteen or so miles by cab, arriving there at around nine o'clock in the evening. The fears of the police appear to have been well founded, as a huge crowd had assembled at Winchester Railway Station to await his arrival. However, some of them did spot the cab on Winchester High Street, and suspecting that Baker might be inside, they began to pelt it with stones, and even attempted to stop the conveyance. They were, however, prevented from doing so. Baker was soon lodged inside a cell at Winchester Jail, where he was kept until December, when his trial took place at Winchester Castle. The trial of Frederick Baker for the murder of Fanny Adams took place in the Great Hall at Winchester Castle before Mr Justice Mellor on Thursday the 5th and Friday the 6th of December, 1867. Montague Beer conducted the prosecution whilst Baker was defended by Samuel Carter. Opening for the prosecution, Beer contended that there was no direct evidence against Baker. His case, he said, was made up of what was known as circumstantial evidence, by which he meant that there were a number of circumstances and facts, all of which perhaps, if each were taken by itself, would not be conclusive, but when joined together, made a chain linked so firm as to render it impossible for the person around whom it was formed to escape. The witnesses who had testified previously were then called, and they gave more or less the same evidence as they had at the inquest into Fanny Adams's death and at Baker's appearance before the magistrates. Acting for the defence, Samuel Carter argued that the prosecution had not proved beyond reasonable doubt that it was in fact Frederick Baker that had carried out the dreadful murder. But even if the jury believed that he had, they should still acquit him, as he could not be held responsible for his actions on grounds of insanity. The defence called several witnesses, including Baker's father and sister, who both testified that Baker had a history of mental illness and that he was weak-minded. Once the various witnesses for the defence had been called, the prosecution and defence presented their closing arguments, the judge gave his summing up, and at five minutes past seven on the Friday night, the jury retired to consider their verdict, taking with them Baker's diary. Twenty minutes later, they returned with a unanimous verdict of guilty. Mr Justice Mellor then donned the black cap and sentenced Frederick Baker to be hanged by the neck until you be dead. The next day, Baker was informed in his cell at Winchester Jail that the date of his execution had been set for December the 24th. Over the next few weeks, there were determined campaigns by his supporters and several newspapers to obtain a reprieve on the grounds of insanity, but they would ultimately prove unsuccessful. He spent his last weeks studying scripture and preparing to meet his creator. On the morning of December the 24th, he dressed himself in his clerk's garb and, bizarrely, even went so far as to don his tall hat before enjoying a final hearty breakfast. 
People had been arriving in the city throughout the night to ensure that they had a good view of the execution when it took place, and by dawn the crowd was several thousand thick, consisting, according to press reports, of some hundreds of working class of Winchester, as many by early trains from Portsmouth and Southampton, a few shopkeepers, a large proportion of women, and a few nondescripts. The scaffold at Winchester Jail was located on the roof, and the execution was due to take place at 8 a.m. The Aldershot Military Gazette published a report on it in its edition of Saturday the 28th of December. At the hour fixed, he was brought out and conducted along the corridors and across the courtyard to the pinioning room. He wore a well-brushed black hat and had evidently been rather attentive to his dressing. He walked steadily enough, and while somewhat pensive, did not manifest any particular emotion. Guarded by warders, and followed by the hangman and those of the officials who are obliged to be present, he went unassisted up the stairs to a room where he was pinioned while sitting in a chair. From thence he went without help to the scaffold, and took his place under the beam. Baker stood on the drop until the hangman had covered his face and secured the rope. Then, while left alone for several terrible moments to allow the reverend chaplain to finish his service, the wretched man quivered from head to foot. The warders stretched out their hands to support him, but as they did so, the bolt was drawn, and the miserable culprit soon ceased to exist. It later transpired that in the days leading up to his execution, Baker had made a full confession. He had also written a contrite letter to George Adams, asking for such forgiveness as might be afforded him. George, so the papers reported, had returned him a consolatory message. As to how the murder of Fanny Adams came to be remembered in the saying, Sweet Fanny Adams, well, her murder coincided with the Admiralty beginning manufacturing its own canned beef to be issued to sailors in the Royal Navy. The seafarers found the contents of the tins so unappetizing that, with typical sailors' black humour, they began to suggest that the tins contained the remains of Fanny Adams. Sailors would utilise the empty tins as mess tins, and these became known as Fannies. During the First World War, soldiers in the trenches got to know the expression Fanny Adams, possibly from sailors on board the transport ships taking them to the front and, appropriating the name, they began to use the expression Sweet Fanny Adams as a substitute for something far ruder, but with the same initials, and used it to refer to something of little or no value. There is a poignant postscript to the Fanny Adams story. On Sunday, April the 21st, 1907, Lloyd's Weekly News published an article under the headline Country Horror terrible crime recalled by victim's father. The article began, One of the most atrocious crimes of the last century is recalled by the tidings that George Adams is still alive at the age of 78 in the workhouse at Farnham. An effort is now being made to raise sufficient money to enable the old man to spend his last years outside the Union walls. George had given an interview to a Lloyd's representative in which he recalled the events of the awful day on which Fanny had been murdered, his eyes filling with tears and his voice faltering as he spoke. The murder was such a terrible blow to my poor wife, George Adams told the reporter, that I had to move from Alton so that she might be reminded of it as little as possible. We went to London where I worked for a builder for twenty-six years. Now she is dead and I'm forced to come here. It would appear that sufficient funds were raised for George to spend some time with his married daughter, Elizabeth, the Lizzie who was with Fanny on the day of her murder. However, he later returned to Farnham Workhouse, where he died on the 17th of February, 1908. And thus the story of Fanny Adams draws to a close. It is a horrible story, but it is also a poignant one. It is often the case with murders that the victims become overshadowed by the notoriety of their murderers and can become almost secondary characters in their own stories. At the time, 
more press coverage was certainly given to Frederick Baker than it was to the eight-year-old girl whose life he cut short so horrifically and so viciously. Yet Fanny's grave is still cared for in Alton Cemetery, and people still visit it to remember her, and to leave flowers to the memory of the girl who went out to play on a long-ago summer's afternoon, and never returned.